are here with our new district attorney, Jackie Lacey. Welcome to the Sentinel. Well, thank you. And on behalf of our publisher, we'd like to wish you the best in your, all your future endeavors, especially in your new job. Now, actually, officially, you will be sworn in on December the 3rd? Yeah, December the 3rd, um, I'll be sworn in. There'll be a public swearing in. It'll be 3 o'clock in the afternoon at uh, the Gailey Center ah. at USC, and we're very excited about being able to secure that location on USC's campus, because you know I'm a Trojan, I graduated from law school from USC, so we're really excited that, that we were able to work that out. Ah, that's, that's pretty so good. you all are the first to hear that, we just sewed that up so, this morning, and, and we certainly hope to see some of our Sentinel people out there. <laughs> we'll, it's we'll, going to we'll, be good. We'll, we'll <laughs> Better be there now. It'll be the place to be. <laughs> Good. You'll the, be there. <laughs> the last time we were talking, we, you were here when you were a candidate, we were talking about hypothetical if or what if and so on. Yeah. Now you are it. Yeah. You can talk some yeah. definite things. Yeah. Now, how does it feel, mm -hmm. actually, you, 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 you are a trailblazer. You are the first mm -hmm. African American and female mm -hmm. district attorney in Los Angeles County. And I believe Los Angeles County has the largest county prosecutor's office. Sure, in, in the, the nation. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel having to run it? That's that's a heavy oh, burden. I, you know what? I've had um, I've had two years to think about it. More than two years to think about it. I've been running for 22 months, December of 2010. So I've had a lot of time to live with the possibility that it could happen. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I sort of feel like the campaigning was the hard part for me because I felt I had enough knowledge to run for the to run the office or else I wouldn't have run but I had to learn how to be a candidate and how to campaign and all of the um, all of the tests you have to go to through to come from really a nobody an unknown to a front runner candidate, there's a tremendous amount of um, growth I have undergone as a result of the process. And I'm still getting used to um, the changes that are going on with being a public figure. Like I was just down the street wow. mailing some stuff. I had, you know, <laughs> thank you cards to mail, and, and I was just going to pop in there and mail my stuff. And I was sort of, I'm always surprised that people say, hey, I know who you are. Uh, you're the district attorney of LA County because remember you're on the other side of the camera I have not I did not watch television that day. I've still didn't watch television I'm barely picking up things and reading the paper and so uh, Something tells me it was a bigger deal than I realized at the time uh, and uh, I, I'm taking that seriously because I'm realizing that um, You know how I treat people how I conduct myself in the office will make the difference between whether there are other people who look like me. Uh, LA County is now 10.3 million people. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than some states, many states. Oh yeah. Um, and it is as diverse as you cannot believe. I mean, um, there are several uh, segments of the Korean population. There are several pockets of African American communities there are several pockets of the Armenian community. And they all have one thing in common, which is safety. Everybody wants to be safe. No one wants to have a fear that uh, they will be the victim of a crime or violent crime. Nobody wants their, their hard-earned um, possessions stolen. Uh, everybody wants you know, to be able to really live in peace without harassment. And yet, with our justice system, as it responds, we all have a sense of, we want it to be fair. We don't want to live in a police state either, right? We don't want to live in some state where ever, there's no privacy, where we're videotaped everywhere we go, where, um, where law enforcement looks at us and uh, makes judgments about us because of the kind of car we wear, the clothes we have on, or the neighborhood we're in. So we all want, we really all want the same thing. And we may differ as to how we get there and what we do to get there, but it's up to the district attorney of LA County uh, to make sure the laws are enforced fairly and that uh, our safety is maintained. It, it is my understanding that whenever a leader goes into a new position, mm -hmm. president, the governor, the mayor, they bring their own people 
Mm -hmm. Do you are you going to make a radical change at the top level of the district attorney since you've been there for so long? Maybe you are I, familiar. I, with I that. wouldn't call it a radical change. I think that um, in a leadership position, uh, there's a couple things you need. You need people that you trust. You need people who are very competent. And if you're smart, you want people who complement your uh, weaknesses. And so I am uh, actively looking within our organization for those people who I know I can trust to make uh, the goals that I want to set, the things that I want to do, happen. Um, the district attorney, he's retiring, and there's going to be some people who've already said they're retiring with them. So that leaves, you know, some openings there. But it's understood when you go into that organization as the leader that uh, you, you have to have people that have your back, uh -huh. people that you can trust, people that get you and you get them. And so I have, uh, in the 12 years, you get, a ch you get a chance to work for people side by side with them. And so you see them from a different view than, say, the boss. And I never forget that kind of thing. You know, I never forget the, you know, how people treated me when I couldn't do anything for them. They all love me today, and I, I, I but I don't buy my hype. You know, I know, <laughs> I don't buy it. I know uh, it's because of my title. But there are people that I'm going to put in place, Yusuf, that um, have a great track record with me. To, you know, just because you have the title, boss, people don't have to do what you say. They don't have to respect you. Um, if you are a poor leader, people do the, the bare minimum. They'll do the bare minimum to get by. We all, all of us, I've had a job where I just wanted to throw up before I went in on Monday morning because the leader was ineffective. They were indecisive. They were mean. They were a bully. They were wimpy. They were, the, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. And um, then I've had people that I've worked for where I wanted to do everything I could to please them. I wanted to do everything I could to make them look good. And that kind of relationship between a leader and the executives or the people that they work for takes time. It is earned. You've got to lead by example. Uh, you've got to uh, follow some basic principles of praising people in public, giving them the credit in public. But if they need to be told they did something wrong, doing that in private and doing it in such a way that you preserve the relationship in the future. Because some people can tell you did something wrong and you're just like mortified and that's not what you want. You want a boss who says, okay, this is the way you should do it. You made a mistake this time, this is the way you should do it. But I believe in you and you have all these great talents. And so if you can work on this, you could be even greater. Now, as you mentioned, public. I. <clears throat> Part of your position mm -hmm. or posture is how the public sees you, how you get along with the public. And I have asked this question to a few law enforcement people, Andrew Barat, when I mm -hmm. interviewed him, I asked him this question, and also the Attorney General. For the most part, the public gets their perception of the DA, of law enforcement, the sheriff, from television. Mm. And most times it's not right. You see Mannix, or you see the, the South You're going case. way back with so Mannix. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> T.J. Hooker. Well, you yeah. see Law and Order. Yeah. Law and Order Law has and done a, a, a more to... Solve whatever it is in one, yeah. one hour. Right. That doesn't happen in the real world. No. What do you have in mind to more or less bring the perception and the reality closer so people will see you as you mm. really are, or your department as it really is, yeah. as far as they are concerned? I, I think that... Um, um, a couple of things. One is that uh, I believe in transparency when it comes to the, pre the press and to the degree that I can uh, shed light on whatever decisions we make that the community is interested in, the press is interested in, uh, I think that's important. I won't oppose, for instance, cameras in the courtroom. I'll continue to keep our same policies. But um, for instance, today is an example of what you're going to see from me. When I leave here, I will have lunch with uh, Danny Bakewell Sr. I don't have anything specific to talk to him about. What I'm interested in is that he understands 
uh, as well as many other community leaders understand that I am their district attorney. And we will have a relationship. I will have a relationship with key law enforcement partners, but also the community. And uh, that kind of thing comes from a deliberate attempt at keeping the relationship going. It's as simple as that. I'm thinking about you. Let's, I don't have any agenda. Can we just get together and talk today? What's on your mind? And this is what we're doing. And here are my goals. And here's what do you think about this? Here's, my, here's, my, um, here's what I want to accomplish. Can you help me in this fashion? Uh, people do need to see you. And I learned that running for office. It's like we have a law enforcement liaison. We need a community liaison. You need to know who to call to find out um, what's going on. I, I realize also that campaigning is much different than governing when you get, when you get oh, there. Oh, it's very, very different. But, 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 but I guess since you are more or less was doing part of the governing for mm -hmm. 22 months or so, then the campaigning was new to you. Now you have to come back to the governing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of business things that have to be taken care of in the office. Uh, you know, the legislature will be in session in January. I want to talk to our legislative um, lobbyist and find out what are we going to do? What's our agenda? You know, the, we've got a super majority of Democrats now mm -hmm. in the um, in the legislature. I want to find out who it is I need to get to know. I know most of them. Uh, but I would like to get to know those who uh, may be helpful and those who I may need to uh, talk to a little bit about uh, our public safety agenda. No, I remember when you were here as a candidate, one of the things we spoke about was Governor Brown's policy that he will empty in the prison, that, that my would, of sending some of the prison population to the, the county jails. Yeah. Uh, and you had a certain take on it. I can't remember exactly what it was. But how do you feel about that now that you've been able I, to I, I still, I, Yeah, it? I still feel the same way, that, um, you know, it was too fast, too soon, Yusuf, and it was um, we, the stakeholders, the people who were going to bear the brunt of this, uh, they weren't really ready. You know, this realignment relies heavily on the probation department figuring out where people are and what services they need. And the probation department has had a leadership change. They've had three different leaders in the last uh, couple of years. So I'm not sure uh, where they are, although the latest leader seems like he's really good. He's kind of cleaning out a lot of the disciplinary problems, which you gotta do. You can't have problems inside your organization and expect to manage a huge change like this. Uh, but, but be that as it may, it's here. And we need to make the best of it. Uh, there are uh, people we can probably get out of that revolving door of crime by putting them on probation, figuring out how to get them jobs, figuring out how to get them um, to leave that life behind and go to school. And that's a great goal for us to have. And so um, it's an opportunity. We're, we're, we're going to see some uptick in crime, but my goal as your district attorney is that when, when I come back here next year to talk to the editorial board, board yeah, <laughs> that we haven't, you, have, you, you haven't seen a difference. You haven't seen more crime. You're not, you know what I mean? You're not writing that there's more violence in the streets. Because I grew up just two blocks from here, two, three blocks from here. And I can remember walking down Coliseum Street over to Dorsey High School and feeling a little fear in my heart. The Crips and the Bloods were, were you know, were starting out and you, you, didn't, you didn't have to be in a gang to get hurt by a gang. Right. And uh, it was a concern. There was definitely a concern. My mother, you could not go to every party. She had to know the parents. And so it was, it was a different time. But now, you know, I look around. I love this area now. And look how much development has occurred. How many restaurants? This is a des your Starbucks is a destination. I remember when it was the bowling alley. <laughs> yes. Remember when it was a bowling alley? And there was a Pontiac right Yeah, there's a Pontiac. This is a destination. When I bring friends to visit my mother, we stop over there uh -huh. and we hang out. And that's the way it should be. Did Governor Brown, with his realignment policy, did he send money with the prisoners from the... From you know, we're still waiting for that check that's in the mail. <laughs> Some of it got there. And, 
you know, I'm most concerned about those who are in need of mental health services, because I think that's the biggest challenge, particularly for African Americans. There's a lot of us who are, um, who are suffering from undiagnosed, untreated mental illness. Some of us are out here on the streets right now. And there is hope. There is, I know so many people who, who are working who are working, who are suffering from mental illness, but they've got it managed. They've got health care. The doctors have found the right drugs to bring them out of their depression or their bipolarness, and they are holding down professional jobs, but that's because they have the support, they have somebody they can trust. There's nothing worse than being lost in your own mental illness and not knowing who to trust. That is a, that is a terrible place to be. And so, what I want the governor to do, because part of realignment came from this uh, Supreme Court case that said that people weren't getting the, the health care they needed in prison. And it included mental health and it included uh, physical care. And the courts ruled that that was just inhumane. They had people in uh, the state, California State Prison locked in telephone size cages, telephone booth size cages who were mentally ill, suicidal, and they didn't have the beds to treat them. So they would, you know, put them in these cages. And these, these pictures of these are, at, are posted at the back of the Supreme Court decision ordering California to release prisoners because it had gotten so bad. That is just not the way to treat people, in prison or out. Uh, mental illness is a disease. It is a legitimate disease. Uh, we have got to uh, get rid of our prejudices, our stigma. We got to clean up our language. I don't want to see the word crazy being used again to describe a legitimately mentally ill person. That can be used for our eccentric friends who are wild, but it should not use it, be used for those who have been diagnosed with a mental Most illness. Most of these eccentric people are eccentric because they got a lot of money. You don't call them crazy. You call them eccentric. Well, I call them crazy. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people with money. I call them crazy, right? You know, my wild friends who are like, what? You did what? Well, they're crazy. But those who are, you know, who are legitimately mentally ill, we write them, we, we casually use that term. It's a derogatory term. We use the same thing. You know, we don't use the word, um, mentally retarded anymore. There's another term. We call them uh, mentally disabled. Uh, we don't really use the word handicapped anymore. Physically challenged. Physically challenged. Same thing needs to occur with those who are mentally ill. If we do that, if we do that, you said people will um, get help. They will get help. And, I, and I guess we should send that message to Ann Coulter. She called the president retarded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of messages that you could send her away, but uh, what, you know, but uh, no. Uh, I'm okay, go ahead. Let's kind of switch of gears. Did you always, and you talked about kind of with your children, you want mm. them to follow their passions, right? right? And I'm kind of inspired by that, you yeah. know, that, that speech you were giving. Did you always want to be an attorney? Did you have a passion in that? Or how did you stumble no. upon this? this no, this I did path? not. I, I wanted, um, when I was growing up, um, my parents are from the South, and the, the smartest, like the most, some of the most educated people were school teachers. Mm -hmm. Those were the people who were really uh, revered in uh, my mother and father's life because they could read, and they were smart. They were, they were a little different than we see now in terms of their status in the community. So I believed when I first started out at UC Irvine that I was going to be a teacher because that's who was worshipped in. I never thought of myself as becoming a lawyer. So some, but somewhere along the way, I went for a summer, and it was the summer, I remember it was the summer that, it's oddly enough how you remember stuff like that, it was the summer that Elvis Presley died. I was working at a preschool. And I thought, I'm, yeah, I'm not good at this. I kept thinking, I'm not good at this. And I love children. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really good at this. So, you know, because I think it takes a special person to be surrounded with young children all day. I showed you were patient. I mean, you realized you weren't that patient. <laughs> yeah, 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 all day. And, and, to make, and to be responsible for making children smarter, right? Because that's what we expect from our teacher, uh, no matter what their levels are. And I realized, oh, no, this is not going to work for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm meandering through 
college, and I got to my junior year, and I needed I needed a, a, a so-called easy class, you know, to fill out my schedule. <laughs> and a friend said, well, go on over there and sign up for this class called the Introduction to the Study of Law. He said, all you got to do, all you got to do is you got to go to court in Santa Ana once a week, and they have speakers, and then you write a paper at the end. That's all you got to do. You get four units. Like, oh, I can do that. I can do that, right? I can show up in court. I could, yeah, and, might, and who knows? The lawyers might be interesting who they bring. And so uh, I went to court in Santa Ana and I'm watching you know all the characters you know because they were telling this is before all the television shows this is before this is before this became a cottage industry right this is before Judge Judy Judge Wapner and so I'm sitting there and and, and although every case was the same you know it's basically somebody owed somebody money the the personalities made it different every case and the elect the electricness between the judge and the and the uh, the the court reporter and the and the bailiff and the litigants, and I thought, you know, I could do this. I could work in an environment that's because I don't like I don't like pushing paper. I don't like really? sitting behind the desk. So this this I could do. And then uh, Irma Brown came to speak. She was uh, one of our first speakers. She's an African American woman. She's a judge now in Inglewood. Back then, she was a young, you know, Farrah Fawcett hair wearing, uh, um, you know, flipped hep hair wearing, young, vibrant, hip African American lawyer woman. And she comes in and she's all sharply dressed. And, <laughs> you know, she's talking about what she does and who she is. And in an instant, I said, you know, I could be that woman. I could be her. Mm. And so I started studying for the LSAT. I applied. And the way I, the way I judge if I'm on the right journey is if doors start to open up. If doors start shutting, I'm on the wrong path. I need to reevaluate, <laughs> right? But if doors start opening up, I know I'm on the right journey for my life. So the first door that opened up for me was I got uh, a pretty darn good score on the LSAT which measures your, your, your analytical skills. And I got into Hastings and USC, which are pretty darn good schools. And I thought, okay, all right, well, let's, you know. So I was gonna go to Hastings because it was far cheaper. It was like $800 or something like that a semester. USC was uh, like $6,000. <laughs> that, would, that would be a steal right now, right? It was, you know, it was, and I was like, okay, I'm going to Hastings, but let me go down here to USC because I've passed this college so many times on exposition getting off the 110 freeway. Let me just go check things out. So I'm in there, I take a tour, and I meet the dean, and, you know, uh, we start talking about law school, and he said, so have you decided? And I said, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go to Hastings. And he says, uh, so what would make you change your mind and choose USC? I said, well, quite frankly, your, your school is just too expensive. Um, I just can't afford it. You know, my parents, they helped with undergrad, but I was on my own beyond that. And so uh, about a week later, I got a letter offering me a full scholarship tuition. And I was like, I'm going to That shows you honesty. <laughs> That's the path to take. That's the path to take. That's where I'm going. And uh, wow. it turned out to be a great. How did you feel though when that moment came through, or when who, or who, what was the moment? Share with me. Who told you? Who came yeah. to you first? Or when did you hear the votes? Uh, I got it in a text message. I was text, not. Yeah, it was. In, I got it in a text message. Wow. Uh, I was not at my election night party. The tradition is you don't arrive. You don't even enjoy your own party. Your election night party is really for your supporters, and you're yeah. supposed to roll in there when victory. Make an entrance. Make an entrance, <laughs> right? So. I got it. The, um, the absentee votes came in with showing me 13 percentage points ahead. And uh, those tend to be conservative. I'm a Democrat. He was a Republican, so I felt. So when I got the text saying you're 13 points ahead, they just count as absentee votes. But we don't want you to declare victory yet because we have so many votes to count. I thought I could breathe. It was like a, a brick got lifted off my chest. And I thought, okay, I've got this. I've got this. Thank you, God. I've got this. <laughs> I got this. And so. <laughs> Then, it was kind of weird, it became a waiting game while we waited for the votes to be counted because I don't know whether you heard, there was a helicopter 
that brings the ballots into Norwalk got fogged in. It was fogged the night of the election. So we were waiting, and then about 10, 15, 10, 30, they text me and said, you better come on over. People are asking where you are. The press is waiting. So instead of giving the victory speech, because I couldn't give it that night. We waited till midnight. We didn't find out I won until 4.32 a.m. the next morning when I logged on my computer. Uh, and so I came in and gave, I thanked everybody in my life. And then I had to end with, now it's still a little early. It's looking good, but it's still a little early. And Cautious uh, optimism. So the champagne, I had to ride with it back home. Uh, <laughs> it's like a, a basketball. Yeah, I had it in the car for my team. We were going to, you know, in, in my out. mind, you know, we were going to pop the wow, cork. Uh, nice. We had to ride with it's it back home. My children came with me. We stayed up. I stayed up till 2.30. I, I couldn't take it anymore. I was so tired. I went to bed. I said, I gotta get, I just got to get up early in the morning. So I went to bed at 2.30, woke up at 4 o'clock. Logged onto my computer, and most of the votes were in, showing they had by uh, nearly 10 percentage points. Oh, wow. uh, but I, um, you know, it was really uh, strange. There was no big jubilation. Um, it was, it's the journey, it's part of the journey. for you a minute and before we close up one of the things that uh, and this has a lot of history behind it traditionally there has always been some heat that's my word between the black community and law enforcement mm -hmm. be it the sheriff the police the district attorney and over the years the demographics in LA County has changed tremendously at least even numerically and for racially and everything else from 2.5 to 10 million now but how is the district attorney's office now that you have been sort of a shepherding along with uh, uh, Mr. Cooley, how is the relationship between the black community in general? You know, I hope it's, I hope, I intend to uh, continue along the trajectory of improving it. I understand why there is a contentious relationship between the black community and uh, law enforcement. All you need to do is around Black History Month, turn on public television, turn on KCET, and um, watch how law enforcement was used in the South to, um, to basically put forth a racist agenda, okay? And a lot of us still have those images burned in our head of, you know, the water hoses, on people who were peacefully protesting, the dogs that were let loose, you know, the trials, the trials that didn't end justly. And so um, some of us will go to our graves, Yusef, with those images uh, burned in our head. But then there is the fa changing face of law enforcement. We've had two African-American chiefs of police, Willie Williams and Bernard Parks. Um, when you go and look at um, who's coming out of the sheriff's academy, it is, it is not uh, an all-white police force. It's very diverse. It's extremely diverse. Uh, in our office, there's a tremendous amount of diversity amongst prosecutors in the court. When I started out uh, in the DA's office in 1986, I would go into court and despite the fact that I was on the court side of the courtroom where the prosecutor should be, people would say, are you the public defender? Are you the court reporter? Are, are, you, the, are you the interpreter? They couldn't, they couldn't believe it. 
you you wouldn't have that today. It would it would it would not uh, be unusual for you to speak to your prosecutor, let's say your witness or victim, and then go in and see somebody of color. That it wouldn't be a surprise to you, if you know what I mean. And so to the degree that um, who we see meeting out justice, the face of who we see meeting out justice changes, I think the relationship will improve. I also, we talked about community policing. Um, I think that, for instance, um, they used to call them lead officers that were in schools. The lead officers did a lot to change the community. Um, this perception of officers. Um, there's a lot of community-based forums that occur. Those are all good. We should, I don't know who came up with the idea of not waiting until there was a crisis to do those things. Um, but that was a good idea, is to have, the, you know, the, 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 to have those regular meetings before the crisis hits. Uh, the same thing with Sheriff Baca. He has a clergy council. What a brilliant idea, because your clergy are generally your leaders in the African American community. And if you can establish a relationship with them, which I intend to do, then when the stuff hits the fan, they're more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt and listen to you, listen to what happened. And, and same thing with them, you're more likely to listen to them and, and, and work through these issues. This is our community. We're all in charge of our safety. It's not just me. And um, I think that dovetails into what I what we were speaking about. At least what I mentioned to you about the story with you, Andre Burat, and Kamala Harris, mm. three top folk. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. have it planned out already in my mind. Right. Anyway, right. Um, um, you haven't came over. You have uh, to ask. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Oh. No. To, to, to the final question was to tie it up. I want you to tell us to tell our constituents, mm. our readers what they can expect from the new day, Jackie Lacey. Well, I, 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 I believe uh, that you're going to see someone who collaborates more. I'm already starting to work with uh, our Attorney General Kamala Harris. I am one of her welcome address speakers in a human trafficking conference that she's having this Friday at USC. Uh, I am friends with Andre Barat. Uh, he has my cell phone. I have his cell phone. We've known each other for several years. I know his wife. Uh, and so those kinds of relationships are going to allow um, the state, the county, the state, and the federal government to pool their resources to address some of our more threatening um, criminal issues, such as mortgage fraud, such as identity theft. Uh, we, you know, I can't stress it enough. It's all about the relationship. You are so much more powerful if you can get rid of the whole ego thing as to who gets credit and start sitting across the table and working together. And we're already doing that. Um, the two of them, I've already spoken to them. They've been so inclusive. Uh, they've let me know they're rooting for me. We're not in competition with each other, okay? And so um, it's an exciting time for LA County. And it's exciting that that I could, somebody like me could, could be the district attorney, that someone who looks like Andre Barat could be the head guy of the central district, which is one of the bis biggest districts oh, yeah. in, the, in the United States, that someone like a Kamala Harris could be the attorney general. Um, we, could, we could inspire so many to seek these types of jobs and for, and for people to learn about it. To people learn what do we do? What so many people don't even know what prosecutors do? Don't know what the DA's office or the attorney. But I hope a kid is sitting there with their parent when they open up the article you write in the Sentinel, and the parent says, "Let me read you this." That happened to me in the voting booth when I was voting. Uh, cameras came out, and a mother was there. I love it when people take their kids. Why don't people take their kids to vote with them to vote? 
why don't they do that? Why, why don't we start doing that? Uh, but a mother had her kid in the, in the voting booth um, okay. with her. And the girl said, Mom, what are all those cameras doing here? Why are they filming that woman? And she looks and she says, that woman's going to be the first woman DA. And this is what she's going to do. And she's, look, she's on our, she's on our ballot. And the little girl, you know, she's got her backpack and she's, you know, you, you have to hope that, um, that she has an Irma Brown moment the way little Jackie Lacey did <laughs> in undergraduate school, right? Isn't that what you hope? Yes, yes, yes. And she says, you know what, I want to do something like that. That's a good thing.